بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Let us start our session It's under the title of gynecologic endoscopy Our first speaker will be Professor Hassan Morsi and he will talk about hip endometriosis and infertility laparoscopy versus ART Father Hassan Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, uh, my name is uh, Hassan Morsi. I'm an associate professor of and Gynae at Ain Shams University. And uh, I was also a consultant gynecologist in England uh, for 16 years and the lead gynecologist at an accredited center in Dudley in the center of England in Birmingham. I'm going to talk about deep endometriosis and infertility, which is a very important debate that I'm sure we're all uh, aware of. The views of comparing laparoscopy versus assisted reproductive technology. Um, on the left of the screen, you can see the accreditation uh, of the center that I was the lead gynecologist for, for five years. And on the right of the screen, you can see the accreditation in an evolving field of medicine called neuropelviology, which is the study of pelvic nerves and their relation to uh, functional and neurofunctional disorders in the pelvis, and in particular, chronic pelvic pain. I'll first start by talking about endometriosis. I'm sure we're all aware of the types of endometriosis, microscopic, subtle, typical endometriosis, cystic endometriosis, or ovarian endometriomas, or chocolate cysts, and deep endometriosis. My talk will specifically concentrate on deep endometriosis. I won't be talking about the other types. I'll specifically concentrate on deep pelvic endometriosis. By definition, this is endometriosis that extends more than five millimeters below the surface of the peritoneum. There's two particular kinds that I'll be talking about, deep infiltrating endometriosis of the bowel, which is by far the most common form of deep endometriosis. Uh, it happens in about 10% of endometriosis cases, and the most commonly affected organ is the rectum and the sigmoid, or the rectosigmoid, in 90% of cases. And unfortunately, it does have a lot of associations. We have Amaha endometriomas, retrocervical lesions, and 70% association with adenomyosis. The treatment of deep endometriosis depends on the size of the nodule or the size of the um, affected area of the bowel. Usually single lesions that are smaller than three centimeters are treated by something called shaving. If it is smaller than three centimeters but causing horizontal bowel wall infiltration of less than 50%, then we proceed to something called disc excision. If it is multifocal or causing pseudo-obstruction or partial obstruction, then we proceed to segmental bowel resection. Deep infiltrating endometriosis of the urinary tract is far less common than the bowel, uh, deep infiltrating form. It is found in about 5% of endometriosis cases, and the most commonly involved organ in the urinary tract is the bladder. And it is usually extrinsic, i.e. compression from the outside or starts from the serosal surface and does very rarely invade the bladder or the ureter. These are some videos to show the concept of shaving of bowel endometriosis. On the top left of the screen, you can see after correction of the anatomy and dissection of the um, different spaces and releasing of all the adhesions, shaving is being done by cold scissors off the surface of the rectum. Uh, in the next video, you will see on the top right of the screen the appearance of frozen pelvis as we start the surgery and on the bottom left hand side of the screen you see sometimes you can find isolated lesions on the bowel without any obvious pelvic endometriosis and this is treated by segmental resection and on the bottom right hand side you can see infiltrating endometriosis in the bladder the bladder has been opened for complete excision of the bladder nodule and repair in two layers. So this is just a quick demonstration of what shaving, disc excision, and segmental resection mean and treatment of bowel, deep infiltrating endometriosis of the bowel. So we have to start from the basics. Does deep infiltrating endometriosis affect fertility? Well, the answer was very clearly found in this study whereby there was three groups of women. All of them had bowel endometriosis. In group C, 50 women had endometriosis with no bowel involvement and the other two had bowel involvement. And following excision of endometriosis, they found that the monthly fecundity rate was significantly better 
in the patients who had complete excision of endometriosis, including bowel endometriosis. And you can see here the figures. The best monthly rate was 3.95 in women without bowel involvement. But when you compare the two groups with bowel involvement and you do a full resection and removal of all endometriosis, the monthly fecundity rate was a lot better with colorectal resection 2.3 compared to 0.84 with incomplete surgery. So the conclusion was that complete removal of endometriosis with bowel segmental resection seems to offer better results in terms of post-operative fertility. So the next question is why does deep endometriosis cause infertility? It causes infertility because it affects the migration of the eggs and the sperms. It causes tubal dysfunction. It distorts the anatomy with extensive adhesions. It is usually associated with adenomyosis, and we know that adenomyosis can reduce the success rate of IVF by about 50%. There's usually association with endometriomas. There's also superficial implants, and there's also chronic inflammation. And we know that the natural conception rate with deep endometriosis is no more than 10%. And these are the most common sites of endometriosis. As you can see, the sites affected are the red dots in Nu'at al-Hamra, and there's a lot more red dots in the posterior part of the pelvis. For example, the back of the cervix, the vagina, the uterosacrals, and the rectum, as opposed to the front of the pelvis, where there's only one dot affecting the bladder. So posterior pelvic endometriosis is extremely common. And this is an important clinical point. When you examine the patients, you have to examine the posterior part of the pelvis and you have to feel the uterosacrals and the posterior fornix because the vast majority of patients with endometriosis will have disease in the posterior part of the pelvis. What about IVF without surgery? Well, the data suggests that we can get conception rates up to 68%, but we have to be careful. This is a cumulative pregnancy rate and it happens after three cycles of IVF. And all of those patients were looked at in a very nice study by Ballester where they looked at the cumulative pregnancy rate after ICSI and IVF in patients with colorectal endometriosis and none of them had surgery. They went straight for IVF, uh, 75 patients, and they found that the cumulative pregnancy rate was 68, nearly 70%, but it was reduced by advanced age, low AMH, and adenomyosis. However, there's a lot of data out there to suggest that surgery followed by IVF is far better than IVF alone. This paper published by Bianchi looked at, uh, it was a prospective study, 180 women, two groups. First group had IVF ICSI alone, second group had surgery followed by IVF. And you can see here the significant difference in the implantation rate and the pregnancy rates between both groups. And the conclusion was that extensive laparoscopic excision of deep endometriosis significantly improves IVF pregnancy rates in women with infertility-associated deep endometriosis. So it makes, to me, it makes no sense at all if you have a patient with deep endometriosis and she will have pain and you ignore the pain and you go straight for IVF. And I will show you further data to suggest that Surgery for IVF, before IVF significantly improves the pregnancy rates, even spontaneous conception. This is another very nice review published quite recently in 2021. And you can see here the group that had surgery before IVF, the um, odds ratio for pregnancy per patient, pregnancy rate per cycle, and the live birth rate were all higher than compared to IVF alone. Even patients who had incomplete surgery even the patients who had incomplete surgery still had a higher odds ratio of becoming pregnant compared to IVF. So the results were very consistent for all the studies, outcomes showing a statistically significant benefit for surgery before IVF. But the downside and the disadvantage was that there was no randomized controlled trials. Another review published in November 2022, looking at deep endometriosis and infertility, what is the impact of surgery? This is a very large review. They looked at nearly 390 articles. 23 were eligible for further review, a total of 1,500 women, and they found a mean pregnancy rate of 52%, and the conclusion was that surgery may improve fertility outcomes. Further sub-analysis, you can look here at, at this table, summarizing all of those results. I'm sorry. You can see here the SP is a spontaneous pregnancy rate and the column on the right-hand side is the medical-assisted reproduction. And you can see consistently that the rates of spontaneous pregnancy after 
excision surgery was far better than medically, so medically assisted reproduction. Except for these three trials, 0%, because these three trials were only focusing on assisted reproduction and they did not give a chance to the patients to get pregnant naturally following surgery. So the take home message from this slide is that there was a significantly increased chance of patients getting pregnant naturally after excision surgery for endometriosis as opposed to going for IVF straight away. Even when we look at bladder endometriosis, this is another study, a group of studies that looked at 207 patients and 123 had an intention for pregnancy so they, were, um, they had proven infertility before surgery. And once again, if you look at the area in red, 36% got pregnant naturally compared to 29% with medically assisted reproduction. So the message I'm trying to get across is that removal of endometriosis can improve spontaneous pregnancy rates without the need for IVF. And the other benefit is that you treat the pain as well because most of those patients will have significant pain. This was a very recent study done by a very, very famous French surgeon called Horace Roman, uh, published in 2022. He followed up the patients for seven years and he compared, um, he, he, he had two groups of patients, both of them with deep endometriosis of the rectum and treated 25 with conservative, that's shaving or disc excision versus 30 patients treated by segmental bowel resection and he followed them up for seven years and he achieved spontaneous pregnancy rates of about 53%, 74% of the patients got pregnant, and overall pregnancy rate of 83%, 83%. And the main advantage was that most patients achieved pregnancy significantly earlier than trying with assisted reproductive technology, and that was a significant difference. So these patients got pregnant naturally, their pain was treated, and they didn't need to go for IVF simply by removing deep endometriosis. So comparing those results, to me, it seems the message seems clear that removal of deep endometriosis improves fertility outcomes even without the need for assisted reproductive technology. And you have to be aware, most of those patients that are going for IVF with deep endometriosis will have large endometriomas will have painful bowel movements, will have significant sciatic and sacral root pain, and some of them can even end up losing their kidney. If there is pressure on the ureter that's not treated in a timely manner, it, they will have progressive hydroureter and hydronephrosis, and eventually they will lose a kidney. So the debate goes on. There is lack of evidence. Unfortunately, there is no randomized controlled trials addressing fertility outcomes of surgery. It is still a clinical dilemma. We need randomized control trials. There are none out there, unfortunately. So as clinicians and as physicians, we have to tailor the treatment. We have to tailor the treatment and take case by case. And you have to take into consideration these very important factors. The age of the patient, the choice of the patient, the preferences of the patient, whether there's pain or not, previous surgical history, previous failed treatment, whether it's surgery or IVF, the duration of infertility, the ovarian reserve, and whether they have other fertility factors, tubal or sperm related. So the debate goes on. As I said, there's no randomized controlled trials, but as an endometriosis specialist, to me, there's two clear indications for surgery, or well, actually three indications for surgery. One of them is if there's pressure on the ureter, if there's evidence of hydroureter, then surgery is not optional. Surgery must be done. If there is subocclusive bowel symptoms or intestinal obstruction, again, surgery must happen. Or if there's severe pain not responding to traditional treatments. Why do we not have any randomized controlled trials? Because all of the studies have a very heterogeneous population of patients. It is very difficult to uh, categorize them according to the location of the disease, the type of the surgery, whether there's any other infertility factors and the effect of medically assisted reproduction because the vast majority of them will be referred straight for IVF without even attempting surgery. The recent guideline by an ISHRI, again, uh, presents several data and in this algorithm they put out the choice and you can see here, they left it open, either surgery or medically assisted reproduction but then at the end, they said that operative laparoscopy, that means treatment of endometriosis or excision of endometriosis, 
may be a treatment choice for symptomatic patients who want to become pregnant. And I have to say the word symptomatic is extremely important because if the patient has pain and infertility, to me, the treatment is laparoscopy. It's not IVF or ART. If the patient has pain, then you must treat the pain. And if you treat the pain, the infertility will improve and they might even get pregnant naturally. So the wording is extremely important. They say for symptomatic patients who want to become pregnant. Hopefully in the next few years, we'll have the answer to this question. There's a large trial called the EFFORT study, which has just started recruitment. Um, women with deep infiltrating endometriosis of the rectum and the sigmoid, young patients wishing to become pregnant. It is a multicentral parallel group randomized trial. Women wanting to get pregnant for at least six months. 350 women randomized to surgery or IVF one-to-one. -one. And the primary outcome is cumulative pregnancy rate and live birth rate. So hopefully we should have the answer to this endless debate in the next few years. Um, this is a very nice paper published again in 2018 where the authors looked at the guidelines of major societies in addition to their own experience. It was a single center with 30 years experience, a tertiary center referral for endometriosis and they devised this algorithm and you can see I've circled surgery and you can see that surgery appears in or is mentioned five times in this algorithm. The only time it's not mentioned if the patient is if the patient has infertility with no pain. So if the patient presents with only infertility and no pain, then you can proceed to IVF. But everything else, you will find surgery. So if the visual score of pain is above seven, then you should offer surgical treatment. If the visual score is less than seven and patient's not responding to treatment, then you should offer surgery. Um, if the AMH is less than 30, if the, sorry, if the AMH is normal and the age is 30, again, you should follow surgery, followed by IVF. And if the AMH is low, above 30, gamete preservation or cryopreservation followed by surgery. So you can see that surgery is a very common theme in this very important algorithm. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank all my teachers over the years. Um, Professor Jaeger, Professor Andreas Muller, Professor Arnold Vatiers, Mr. Graham Phillips, uh, Elizabeth Janschek, and Professor Keckstein, who will be giving a very important talk tomorrow about the Enzian classification of endometriosis. He'll be with us tomorrow. Uh, Shaheen Kazali in England, uh, Dr. Mark Possever, the founder of New York Pelviology, and Dr. Marcello Ceccaroni, who's the father of surgical pelvic anatomy. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Professor uh, Hassan Morsi. Uh, and I now and, uh, introduce uh, Professor Mohammed Damr, uh, talking about a rising new indication for hysteroscopy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will talk uh, about arising new indications for hysteroscopy. Uh, first of all, we will talk about the uh, importance of the use of hysteroscopy in cases of infertility. I can't diagnose the case unexplained infertility without the use of hysteroscopy because of direct visualization of cervical, canal, uterine cavity, and tubal ulcer are important to diagnose some lesions uh, that cause the infertility. We'll talk about the cervical factor in the cervix, the cervical canal, cesarean section niche, and about and follicles, oasis metaplasia of the cervix. Tubal factor as coronal microbolips, coronal obstruction, estroscopic tubal occlusion patients with hydrosalbings prior to IVF. The trying factor of infertility as fibroids, endometrial polyps, endometritis, uterine septa, hypoplastic uterus, intrauterine adhesions, and oasis metaplasia of the endometrium. First cervical factor, this photo is very important. This is the normal healthy endocervix and should be present because of the single tall columnar layer of cells extended to a large area in the presence of these scripts. Important source of cervical mucus as the medium for swimming up of the sperm. Besides that, it acts as a reservoir for the sperm if the intercourse occurs before uh, the time of ovulation by one or two days. So it acts as a source of the sperms in this area. So this is unhealthy cervix. If you find this cervix with smooth, without 
smooth in the surface without the end of cervical crevice, there is no cervical mucus. There is no reservoir of sperm. So refer this patient immediately for intrauterine insemination. Cervical synecia diagnosed with hysteroscopy and could be treated also. Then the cervical polyps, multiple nebotian follicles. It could be a factor of infertility also. It acts as a, a soft tissue obstruction. You can diagnose the hysteroscopy and, with the hysteroscopy and uh, treat it also. Uh, it, uh, it, is, it, is, it is normal physiological process occurring as a result of the metaplasia. Long and tortuous cervical canal. Many cases of failed IVF and exe refer to the endoscopy unit because of this factor. Long cervical canal or tortuous, you should draw this canal to the uh, IVF center uh, physician to, uh, be, to take care uh, at the time of embryo transfer. The cesarean section issue is raising today one of the important factors of infertility. It is diagnosed by many methods of investigations, mainly uh, ultrasound and sonostrography and MRI. Uh, also, the stroscopy can diagnose the condition. Besides that, it can treat the case. One of mode of therapy of uh, cesarean section is, is with the use of hysteroscopy. By removing the lower and upper edge of the niche, besides that, the cauterization of the bed of the niche to, the, to destroy any uh, abnormal blood vessels. This uh, slide is very important. Uh, this is a case of cesarean section niche with creeping endometrium to the cesarean section niche. This is the case at which the scar pregnancy occur. So I advise any patient with cesarean section niche should be referred to one of the sonographers, which is a good one, to diagnose if there is endometrial tissue extended to the cesarean section niche and it appears like a polyboid. So, so this case should be referred to best one of our endoscopists to cauterize and damage this endometrial tissue to avoid the occurrence of scar pregnancy. So scar pregnancy could be prevented uh, if you cauterize any endometrial tissue in the scar niche. This is another scar niche below. There is no endometrial tissue. This could not harbor any pregnancy. No scar pregnancy occur in this case. This is a rare case also as metabolism of the endoscopist. I saw three cases. One combined with osseous metabolism of the endometrium, one solitary cervical, endocervical uh, osseous metabolism, and the third one due to, uh, it is not infertile, but due to chronic cervical infection. So, in the previous slide, any case you are doing uh, ultrasound for her and you find any echogenicity in the endocervix or of in the uterine cavity, please think of osseous metabolism could be missed very easy. So refer for stroscopy and remove this mess and management is removal of these bones and giving proper antibiotics. This is the histopathology of that case. The bones removed and it proved to be by histopathology, it is bony tissue. Tubal factor of infertility. This is normal hist healthy tubal osseum. It will be seen as a saucer shaped like that. If you find micropolyps in the mid coronal micropolyps could not be diagnosed with other mode of investigations even of some hysterography because it is a very small polyps, one or two millimeter in diameter. Uh, it could appear as a blocked or coronal uh, occlusion in hysterosarbongeography, but might be present and the tubal osseous seen, uh, tubal uh, corner seen uh, patent. So at hysteroscopy, you, you might find the uh, endomet uh, coronal micropolyps and you can treat it immediately with grass bar to remove these uh, polyps. Coronal obstruction, also one of the uh, tabir at the salbangiography as a coronal occlusion uh, could be treated with stroscopy using tubal cannulation but should be under laparoscopic guide to be sure that the end of the or the rest of the tube is patent or sorry is healthy and to confirm that there is no uh, perforation of the tube during cannulation. Tubal occlusion in patients with hydrosarms prior to IVF if I, we know that the hydrosarms decrease the success rate of IVF so uh, any patients with hydrosalbings referred for uh, tubal occlusion. It is better to be done with laparoscopy, uh, to be sure, yeah, or with laparotomy. But in some cases, there might be extensive pelvic adhesions that the surgeon could not reach the tube to uh, occlude it. So, such cases, you can occlude it by hysteroscopy. Previously, the issue was used and very effective method of contraception sterilization, but is withdrawn now from the market. 
because of the complications. And the buyer company pulled the shore uh, 2019 because of many litigations for its complications. The use of bipolar needle cauterization to occlude the hydrosalpinx tube, uh, the failure rate is more than 35%, so we can't depend on it for management of cases of hydrosalpinx or sterilization. The family of cyanoacrylates is strong, fast-acting adhesives with several industrial, medical, and household uses, even many forms they are used in household conditions and derma bond in the skin and the amacrylate which is used in, uh, to occlude the esophageal and gastric varices and many tracheoesophageal fistulas and uh, the dentist can use it many uh, indications. The stroscopic tubal occlusion using isoamyl to uh, cyanoacrylate, uh, I used it uh, about five years ago in patients that will, that uh, hysterectomy was indicated, and we found that there is immediate occlusion of the tube. And later we used the eight in patients with hydrocephalic prior to IVF, and we found that uh, having a success rate of more than 85% after two trials. Uh, it is very easy to use. We use ureteric caster with terminal opening for French diameter, and we introduce it in the side channel of the hysteroscopy, and then cannulate the first or the lowest half centimeter of the uh, fallopian tube and then injecting the material. It solidifies within five to 10 seconds, immediate solidification and occlusion of the tube occurs. And you could repeat it even after two or three days if after one day of injection, you did hysterogram and the tube still is patent or partially occluded, you can use it again. It costs all of this process, the catheter and the amacrylate about $15. So it is cheap material. It is inert material. Uh, till now, we didn't find any uh, side effects to the use of this material. It is easy procedure, could be done without anesthesia. Only there might be a mild pain at the site of the lower abdomen, at the side of the uh, tube injected, and this is due to the thermogenic effect of the material used. The trying factor of infertility, one of the types of myomatas that we are uh, we could remove it with strokes type 0, type 1, type 2 could be, repeat, could be done at two sessions. And if you remove the bulging part of the myoma in the cavity at one session and then the, uh, the, uh, till you remove the shreds of the myoma from the uterine cavity and giving the patient methergine and massage the uterus, the rest of the myoma could be expelled at the same setting and you could remove some types of type 2 myoma. This is submucous myoma. The endometrium and the infertility is very, and the fertility is important also. This is normal, healthy endometrium, thin, with smooth surface, but if you find the endometrium like that polyboid or so, you should think of endometrial hyperplasia. Uh, the endometrial polyps that could be diagnosed may by sonostrography and three-dimensional ultrasound and by hysteroscopy, you could diagnose and remove it at the same setting. The endometritis, the Cicinelli uh, said that you can diagnose more than 70% of cases of endometritis with uh, hysteroscopy if you find endometrial microbolips. The gold standard for diagnosis of endometritis is by histopathology, finding the plasma cells, but uh, you, could, you could suspect the patient having endometritis if you find endometrial micropolyps at the hysteroscopy. This is uh, one of the five cases I saw of the osseous metabolism of the endometrium. The first, this patient referred to the unit of uh, early cancer detection and those at Kenshams University of being having filling defect at hysterosalpingography that was suspected to having uh, intrauterine adhesions. At the hysteroscopy, we find that uh, there is whitish, whitish masses inside the uterine cavity, biopsy taken from it and proved to be osseous metabolasia of the endometrium. Many theories to explain the osseous metabolasia of the endometrium, one of them is the chronic irritation due to chronic endometritis. And the management is by removing these bones by stroscopy and DNC, and then later giving the patient of upper genital tract infection treatment and antibiotics. So any patient, you have any echogenicity in the uterus or in the cervix, unexplained echogenic masses, you should suspect osseous metabolasia. Refer for stroscopy. Mullerian anomaly is the commonest lesion, is a uterine septum, could have many side effects, and uh, now is uh, very easy to be uh, diagnosed and uh, treated by hysteroscopy, even as an outpatient if it is septum, thin septum. We can do just incision either by 
scissor or by diathermy. Recurrent uterine septum, yes, you can, uh, the septum could be recurrent if it contains more muscle tissue than the fibrous tissue. Most of the uterine septa are fibrous, so there will be a retraction occur in the septum to the walls of the uterus just after incision. If you find the redundant septum after incision, please do excision to avoid re-adhesions maritime. The hypoplastic uterus, the reductive impact hypoplastic uteri suffers from an inconsistent definition of small uterus in the uterine. Actually, there is no objective method to diagnose the uterine cavity volume. No objective methods. This paper, now there is paper under publication in the Alder South Journal by me about the objective method used to diagnose the uterine, to measure the uterine cavity volume. The hypoplastic uterus could cause infertility and the management by Broto Babas said that we can, you can do linear incisions all through the length of the uterus. Uh, the, the uterus will open like accordion and enlarge the cavity and many of the patients that he did for, uh, for them uh, got pregnant spontaneous pregnancy. The intrauterine adhesion is nightmares of hysteroscopist and even many grades the important is the uh, severe grade with tubular uterine cavity. The main management is lysis of these adhesions. The second is to prevent the recurrence of these adhesions. It's better to be removed with scissors called knife uh, and there is a method now I am using is the balloon distension metroplasty. And used by me as a treatment and a prognostic factor in severe intrauterine adhesions. In severe uterine adhesions with tubular cavity, I made lin linear incisions all through uterine cavity, and then introducing the fullest pediatric fullest gaster, tamania, or eight or, two, or 12 uh, French, eight, 10 or French, uh, 12 French uh, catheter, inflate the balloon by four or five milliliter of saline. If it goes and is distended, at the start, of, there will be resistance. Then, if it is distended, taking this volume, mostly these adhesions in the endometrium and not extending to the myometrium. If there is resistance to distend this balloon, mostly these uh, adhesions extending to the myometrium, and in such case, you should do linear incisions using the knife diathermy, using cutting current to enlarge, to uh, cut through the muscle tissue. Uh, so, there should be the recurrence of uh, intrauterine adhesions after lysis of severe one from 30 to 60 percent so you should use other methods to prevent the recurrence from them either pure mechanical separator like lip loop in the past but not present now not, man not manufactured or using elastic sheets or intrauterine uh, balloon from of the, uh, one of them is a cook medical balloon but it is a large one having many sizes and it is very difficult to reach this size in cases of severe intrauterine adhesions. And the cavity not regular. And there is a stem of the catheter that it extends out of the cervical canal which could lead to ascending infection. But we use the intrauterine balloon of the pediatric foliage caster after cutting its stem short of the balloon so that no part of the balloon is seen out of the cervix and you can leave it for two weeks and remove it later by crocodile forceps. Then later we use the human amniotic membrane, either the fresh one or the freeze-dried amniotic uh, membrane. We know that the fresh amniotic membrane is uh, one of the richest sort of pluridermal mesenchymal stem cells, even more better than the cord of blood. There's no teratoma formation. We use it over the balloon and either as amniotic batch or amniotic graft. And we, uh, in such a slide, these amniotic uh, graft seen two months after uh, application of the amniotic membrane and might contain blood vessels also. And after the histopathologic examination, there's endometrial glands and endometrial, and endometrial stroma, either creeping over the graft or uh, from uh, originating from stem cells in the amniotic membrane itself. Abnormal uterine bleeding having many causes, but in some cases we have no explanation. It might be due to coronal microbiomes, it might be due to superficial adenomyosis, or oh, and the management is by endometrial ablation or resection. It might be due to cesarean section niche itself. It might be due to endometrial polyps. The mesda IG also, if there is no threads out of the, cervic, of the cervical canal, please do hysteroscopy to remove it within a few minutes, two or three minutes. Uh, don't try doing uh, manipulating the uterus uh, blindly. The malignancy hysteroscopy is contraindicated in the present cervical cancer. Uh, but could be used in the neutral carcinoma with low intrauterine pressure. 
persistent abnormal, abnormal vaginal discharge, please do a stroscopy in patient with persistent abnormal vaginal discharge that not responding to the treatment and not diagnosed. Like this, uh, and the cervical polyp in a version or osseous metabolism in a patient with trichomonas vagin as, uh, vaginitis and cervicitis. Uh, this is a case of uh, missed hair pain in the uh, vagina in a girl of 11 years old or so. Removal adherent remains of conception. These are few cases I saw in the last six months. Uh, adherent remains of conception that could not be removed even with mistake or so, and even other ultrasound guide. Uh, so we can use the cold loop resectoscope to remove these uh, remains of conception. Some of them was adherent, so I used the uh, diathermy to remove these uh, remains of conception. And thank you. Next speaker will be Dr. Rebecca Malik from Great Britain. She's a consultant OBGYN at uh, the Sussex uh, Endometrial Endometriosis Center. She's specialized in advanced uh, minimal access surgery. And uh, she is the leading in the training programs, the director for OBGYN training in Kent and Sussex uh, University. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for the organizing committee for asking me to come and talk. Um, as the introduction, my name is Rebecca Malik. I'm a consultant gynecologist at University Hospital Sussex. I am an endometriosis specialist and I do a lot of training, simulation training with our trainees in Kent, Surrey and Sussex. So what I thought we'd talk about today is looking at the challenges with gynecological surgical training. It's interesting because I chatted to a few people since I've been here the last couple of days and I've been told that there's not a lot of simulation that happens around, but I believe my colleague is gonna have a, do a fantastic talk next who will be able to tell us about um, what is going on in Cairo. But uh, from what I heard, there wasn't a huge amount of structured simulation training. So I'm gonna just talk about that today. I'm gonna to talk about the benefits of simulation training, and I'm gonna share with you the laparoscopy course that we've introduced in KSS, and that's based on the RCOG uh, simulation training program that they have advised that we introduce. So uh, there are m many challenges that we face in the UK. Some are very different to the challenges that you face here in Egypt. Some are very, very similar. We have huge waiting lists in the UK because of COVID-19. Patients wait 18 months plus for their surgery. So there is a real drive to get patients through and less trainees have got uh, hands-on training. Since the European Working Time Directive, a lot of trainees have been moved to a more team a rota system rather than a team-based system. So they don't have that mentorship that we used to have when training. And one of the big issues in the UK at the moment is we have a huge rota gaps. So if anyone is looking for a job in the UK, please come and speak to me after the conference. But in all seriousness, we have huge gaps in the UK and a lot of trainees are pulled out of theater to, uh, to cover um, uh, the, the, the on-call rota. And the main thing about the UK is we focus a lot on obstetrics. So for the first couple of years of training, there is a lot of focus on obstetrics. The last couple of years is where trainees tend to focus on their gynecology. This was the toolkit that the RCOG released just a couple of months ago. I had the pleasure of being on the committee to write the toolkit. And this is uh, the, a national training program that they have suggested that we introduce. So if we look at surgical training, I think you can split it up into two areas. One area is the knowledge that's very easy to to get, you can come to conferences, you can read books, you can watch colleagues operate. The main issue is skill development. And there's two ways of doing that. You can get the skills in theater if you've got high numbers. We cannot do that in the UK. There's just not enough theater to train all our trainees. So we need to think outside the box and this is where simulation training really comes in. And I think the key questions we've got to ask is, does simulation training work? 
and it, can it bridge that gap to help train the next generation of trainees? So if we look at the benefits of simulation training, there is a lot of evidence to say that it is beneficial. We know that it improves manual dexterity, it improves hand-eye coordination, it improves those fine motor tasks like laparoscopic suturing, it increases confidence in the trainer and the trainee, and actually probably most importantly is it improves patient outcomes. So it just reduces surgical complication and improves patient outcomes. The main thing with laparoscopic training is it's all about repetition and practice. We know that if you have a one-off session, you gain skills, absolutely, but you don't retain those skills. We've all been to a course, did some suturing, six weeks later, you've forgotten the steps. The key thing for successful training is repetition and practice, and that will ingrain the skills. And this is a really important slide. So when you look at a key skill like suturing, the vast majority of it can be gained through simulation. Only a small proportion is gained through operating and only a very small proportion is gained through just natural skill. So you can gain a lot of this through um, simulation. So when we sat down with the college and with our KSS laparoscopy course, we came up with six main criteria that is really important when we're putting together a simulation training program. The key thing is it needs to be accessible. So it needs to be somewhere that the trainees can access, somewhere central. It needs to be cost effective. You cannot charge trainees thousands of pounds to attend a course. So it needs to be something that they can afford, but it also needs to be cost effective for the, the place that's running the course as well. It needs to be up to date, it needs to be in line with our COG core curriculum, and the key thing is it needs to be all about repetition and practice with spaced out sessions to consolidate learning. So this is, this is the course that we developed. For those of you who don't know um, the UK, KSS is a small, relatively small area on the south coast of, of England. We've been running the course for two years now, and I'm going to share with you the data from 2023. The way that we set it up was that it was accessible. It was in a central area within KSS. We made sure it was funded by the deanery. So the trainees do not have to pay to go on this course. So it's funded by the, the deanery themselves. It's up to date. It was in line with the RCOG uh, core curriculum and the MRCOG core curriculum. And the key thing about it was that it was very much all to do with repetition, practice, and spaced out learning. So this is how we set it up. We had a basic, a basic session for our ST1 and 2 trainees, intermediate session for our year 3 to 5 trainees, and an advanced session for our 4 to 7 trainees. So they all got training throughout the, their whole training program. So what kind of theory? The theory was covered in lectures. So for the basic stream, we, we started off with entry techniques, anatomy, ergonomics, diagnostic laparoscopy, but it was really key that we started off with, with um, key skills like laparoscopic suturing. Uh, when you then move on to the intermediate stream, we took it a little bit further. So they did more advanced sidewall anatomy, ectopic pregnancies, uh, ovarian pathology, hysterectomy, and then on the advanced stream, we took it one more step further and they did more aspects of total laparoscopic hysterectomy, subtotal hysterectomy, myomectomy, morcellation, and surgical complications. So this is, the, this is the fun part. So for the simulation part, we had a mixture of low fidelity exercises, high fidelity exercises. And the key thing for this course was that every single trainee who attended, so in 2022, we had 60 trainees all trainees were given a box trainer to take home to keep with their own equipment that they could practice their skills at home. And I think this was key to developing their skills. So these are some of the exercises that we introduced. You can see they're quite basic, but it is really important to develop that hand-eye coordination, the manual dexterity at the beginning. We used the Innovis equipment, but there are lots of other companies available. But the key thing is just developing right, left hand coordination um, and just yeah, basic, basic laparoscopic skills. For me, it was really important that all trainees were able to suture laparoscopically. So our year one and two trainees were all able to suture, handle a needle, tie knots by the end of the training program. 
For our more uh, intermediate and advanced trainees, we did some low fidelity. So these are models that are very easy to make for the trainee at home. The top right hand corner is a, a sapingectomy model very easy to make. They can practice salpingostomy, salpingectomy. The middle model, more difficult to see in the picture, but this is an ovarian cystectomy simulation. And the one on the left, the video, was made by a colleague of mine to simulate venous needle entry, to simulate the two clicks. Really difficult to, 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 for you to practice. And so it was a really helpful model. All of the sessions had a wet lab session, and I think this is really important for trainees. So on this wet lab session, we uh, used electrosurgery, so they all had hands-on training with a harmonic scalpel. They used monopolar energy to practice colpotomy. Um, so we had monopolar hooks, scissors, etc. And they also practiced dissection skills and suturing on, on uh, tissue. This model is absolutely fantastic and definitely something to look into if you do a lot of simulation training or you want to start simulation training. We use this for the intermediate and the advanced groups. So this is an Ethicon model. And with one model, you can do a salpingostomy, a salpingectomy, a BSO. The uterus itself, as you can see, has a large intramural fibroid. You can do a myomectomy and suture. Uh, and there is a cyst. It's difficult to see in the picture, but one of the ovaries contains a cyst. They can do a cystectomy. They can finish it off and do a hysterectomy. And the model even has ureters. So you can open it up and do a sidewall dissection. So really, really great for the intermediate and advanced trainees. We also used augmented reality, again, for the more senior trainees. Again, we use Innovis. Lots of different companies are available. Um, augmented reality is slightly different in that these are, these are real plastic models with simulation placed on top of it so the trainees can get hand-eye coordination, but they find this really, really useful. So you've got vault suturing, as you can see, and a salpingectomy as well. And I think this is the key thing, as I said. All the trainees had a box trainer to take home, four instruments, needle holder, suit, needle holder Mary Lance, Johan, uh, scissors. They all got sutures. They got a vaginal vault model. They got multiple bases to play with and a lap pass kit. And this was the trainees to keep uh, and use as they wish. So the key question is, does it work? It sounds very good. It sounds you know, fun for everyone to have a lap box and to go on a training session, but does it work? And this was really important for me when we were doing this program, was to collect subjective and objective data to see if this does actually work. So the subjective data we, we collected was all the trainees were asked to fill in a survey that quantified their own skills, confidence at the beginning of the course and at the end of the course. And for the objective data, we use the LAP AR. And on the LAP AR, you can look at four met metrics. These are uh, time to complete a task, the distance traveled, smoothness, and speed. So these are quantifiable metrics that you can look at as you're developing your surgical skills. And I think, again, this is probably the second most important slide of the presentation, but when you looked at 60 trainees across all of the metrics, there was a statistically significant improvement in all the trainees. So time improved, distance travel improved, smoothness, you want to go down the higher the smoothness, the jerkier the movements, so a significant improvement in smoothness and also a significant improvement in speed. So across all metrics, trainees got better using this kind of training program. We split it up into the beginner groups. There was a significant improvement with time, uh, speed, and smoothness. An improvement in distance travel, but not statistically significant. When we looked at the survey, the trainees themselves noted, noted a, or uh, when we looked at it statistically, there was a statistics significant improvement between the beginning and the end questionnaire, which is really helpful. And all of them felt that the course had improved their surgical skills, would recommend the course to a colleague and find the box trainer helpful. And that was the same across the intermediate group. Again, very similar in terms of finding it helpful, improving confidence, and exactly the same across the advanced group. What was interesting and what you expected was that for the advanced group, there was less an improvement for the basic knowledge and skills like anatomy, uh, electrosurgery, laparoscopic entry, but for the more advanced skills like a laparoscopic myomectomy, a hysterectomy or suturing, they felt that laparoscopic simulation had significantly helped their training. The trainees themselves gave excellent feedback and found the course really helpful. 
And moving forward for 2023, we're also adding in a hysteroscopy element. So um, similar to the last a talk that we had. We're going to help our trainees develop skills in diagnostic hysteroscopy, septum resection, endometrial ablation, and this is all going to be done using simulation training. So last slide really is to say that simulation training definitely works. For me, I think it's important to instill this at a young age, so our very junior trainees, and allow them to develop throughout the training program. It is really key that a structured training program is introduced. It is much better to introduce structured training over a spaced out period of time rather than one-off courses. If you can facilitate a box trainer to, that the trainees can take home, that's fantastic. Not every course can afford to give a trainee a box trainer, but you can have a scheme where it's loaned down, it comes back at the end of the course, that's also really helpful. We know that simulation training improves confidence and skills. It also allows the trainees to really capitalize on the surgical opportunities when they get to theater. And I do think it is key to, to bridging that gap that we certainly have in the UK. And it'd be interesting to hear what gaps that are, uh, surgical gaps are, are at this end as well. And I think it's important to embrace the future. I'm looking forward to the next talk because I think it really is the future of, of surgical training, AR, VR, and, and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Malik, for this um, very interesting uh, presentation. And I think we'll go on on the same note. And it's my pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Mohammed, Ahmed Minawi, uh, who is a very skilled laparoscopist. I'm sure that all, you, all of you know him. And above all, actually, he's a devoted trainer and tutor, especially in the field of laparoscopy. Uh, started a very uh, prestigious system and unit at Cairo University, and he's advancing it further and further. And uh, uh, Professor Ahmed Minawi today is going to uh, address us on virtual reality, and augmented reality, and skills labs. Are they uh, beneficial? The experience in OBGYN at Cairo University. Professor um, Minawi. Thank you very much, Professor. Appreciate uh, your words. Uh, I just want to start by saying that I literally spent years all over the world training in laparoscopy and robotics over the past 30 plus years. And I always wanted to give back to our community, to our medical school. And so when the time came and I was able to do this, I pushed hard in order to try and put something together that uh, would benefit uh, the younger uh, generations. So basically disclosures, I have no financial interests, but everything that I'm showcasing was funded by generous anonymous donors no burden on the university, no burden on the state. We're talking roughly almost 40 million pounds worth of equipment by next month, inshallah. So this is William Halstead. Um, he was a professor at Johns Hopkins where I trained before. Uh, William Halstead had a very, very, very famous motto, which was uh, basically see one, do one, teach one. And everybody was taught that way. We saw one, we did one, we taught one. But that's totally changed. Right now, we cannot do this. Today's requirements are very, very different. All of this changed during the latter half of the 20th century when endoscopy started to basically become main line all over the world. And so we had to try and train the next generation of surgeons in a very, very different way. And then came COVID. In the past three years, everything went topsy-turvy. Everything was totally changed. Almost all hospitals, including our own and in Shams also, they stopped uh, accepting elective cases in the UK, as Dr. Malik said, significant reduction in hours of training. In, in Egypt, this is Asrlaini. We uh, our medical school is at the tip of Rhoda Island, and, and this is an aerial view from above. It's almost 8,000 beds, and this is Muhammad Ali Besha, who basically brought in this doctor, Antoine Claude Beg, back in 1825 to found our medical school. So our medical school is older than our university by 100 years, actually. And so this is our building. Right now, it's hidden by a hotel, but this is where we actually work. And just before COVID, uh, in OBGYN, we had roughly five to 6,000 elective surgeries, almost 20,000 deliveries, 37,500 outpatient visits. All this changed after. We had an 80% drop in elective surgical cases, 35% drop in deliveries, 
85% drop in outpatient visits and a major drop in our residency training. So the, basically this crisis all over the world spurred innovation and advanced digital technologies. And of course, who here did not use Zoom? But you cannot learn by Zoom alone. It's very, very important that you have practical training. And so perceptual and psychomotor skills, these are what are effective for endoscopic surgery and you cannot develop them by looking at videos or lectures or attending seminars. And so basically, what did we do? What did we need to do? How do we train doctors when we don't have patients? How do we train doctors to deal with uncommon difficult obstetric uh, situations? The solution is digital technology, the virtual trinity, which is three things actually, VR, AR, and MR, virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. And the studies and evidence-based medicine shows that uh, basically basic simulation training procedure skill sets are 40 to 70% better in trainees who followed a simulation rather than a traditional approach to training. And all the up-to-date data show this. So simulation is basically part and parcel of current modern uh, training and it's here to stay. So what is, what is VR simulation? VR simulation basically uh, allows you to simulate, to practice multiple times. You can practice a hundred times without harming a patient. Uh, let me just go back for a second. Could you fix the slideshow, please? Yes, stop here, please. Okay, so we're not harming patients. So proficiency-based training, proficiency-based training is not new, but proficiency-based training using virtual reality is now mainstream after COVID. This guy, Herming Ebbinghaus, back in Germany in 1885, termed the forgetting curve. Now he said that memories are longer lasting when it's repetitive, or when it is more significant or striking. VR training is more striking. You have both visual and spatial memory. And so basically it allows better information retention when you're also using virtual reality training. So let's go back a couple of years. A couple of years before COVID, we tried to introduce digital um, basically medicine. And this led us to use our pathological museum which was inaugurated back in 1929 and contains over 1,300 specimens by Nagib Pasha Mahfouz, who uh, basically started up the department of OBGYN back in 1908. And he left us with almost 1,300 specimens. <coughs> now these enabled us to make the first QR code enabled teratological museum in the world, actually. We have QR codes on all the specimens which enable you to look at videos, look at scans, look at info. Even in our textbook, we have the QR codes. So basically the students can actually learn and see various surgeries, et cetera, based on the pathology, just by pointing their phone or their tablet at the specimens. And we're doing even more. We have over 100,000 views so far on this website and you're welcome to come visit the museum. This is the QR code if anyone is interested in looking at it. And like Martin Luther King, I had a dream. I had a dream that I trained in laparoscopic surgery and robotic surgery and always wanted to teach the younger generation. I had chances that they do not or do not have the capability to do. They're not able to travel and spend years and years with the best in the world. So I wanted to give something back to our university. And the problem was financing. How do you pay for all this? Well. Who paid? My friends, literally my friends, some of my patients. When I talked to them about this, they basically said, okay. And I said, listen, we don't want money. We want equipment. And they would donate the equipment that we need to the tune of almost 40 million pounds uh, so far. So with this, we started up Vizalca. Vizalca basically is an acronym and it stands for Virtual Endoscopic Simulation and Skills Acquisition Lab at Asrlaini, and this is what it stands for. And this is part of it. We have several rooms. We have basically an area where we can do outpatient hysteroscopy during our courses. We have a conference room, and we're adding a room uh, starting next month for our newly uh, purchased obstetrical simulators, which are coming in. We have 
three virtual reality simulators. We have the Rolls-Royce of simulators from Vertimed, the Lapro S. We have the Gyno S, which does hysteroscopy ID insertion. Uh, and uh, basically, we also have the obstetrical simulators and an ultrasound simulator that also arrived. In addition to the pelvic trainers, we have about eight pelvic trainers with the, with the telepacks and the instrumentation and what have you, both for, the te uh, for his laparoscopy and we also have the models for hysteroscopy also. This is our first simulator, the LapSim from Sweden. This has haptic feedback, which is force feedback. It also has 2D, it has 3D, and it has immersive 360 degree vision also. Um, what we did is this. We started out with minimal training courses. I found it was very, very difficult to get the residents on board. Very, very difficult to get the staff on board. The staff didn't believe in it. They didn't understand it. And so I thought, okay, then we'll start with research. Because research, the candidates will automatically try to bring in the people. And this is what actually what worked. And this is the, the model that we started with before going into structured training. So our first was a comparative study by Najima Sherpa. She was my senior registrar. She was from Nepal, actually. And we did a study to determine the proper sequence. Should we use the pelvic trainer first or should we use a virtual reality simulator? At that time, it was the lap sim. And our trainees were 21st year residents with absolutely no um, uh, sort of like experience. They'd never seen an endoscope before. And so this is uh, Dr. Sherpa working on the lap sim, and these are some of our doctors working on the uh, pelvic trainers. And here you can see uh, working on navigation on the simulator and working on navigation down on the pelvic trainers. And we found that it was better to start with the pelvic trainers rather than start with the virtual reality trainers. And then we had another study also involving another 20 first year residents. We compared a structured training program uh, using virtual reality versus basic gynecological laparoscopy, non-virtual using the pelvic trainers. This was by Dr. Marianne William. And basically, this is Dr. William. Here, we actually used tissue to do salpingectomies. And we also did salpingectomies on the actual uh, virtual reality machines. We did all sorts of things, suturing, etc. We had a multitude of different things. And in the end, we found that those who trained on basic suturing, it was easier to start with the pelvic trainers rather than to start with the virtual reality machines. But for surgery like salpingectomies or salpingostomies, it was easier actually, and the learning curve was quicker when they used the virtual reality machines. These are some of the um, uh, exercises, the basic exercises that are present on the lap sim. Uh, the newer machine has even more. We have over 26 different uh, exercises. In addition, we have the modules for hysterectomy, for myomectomy, for salpingectomies, for a variety of different things. Our newest laparoscopy edition was this one. This is lap sim, the Rolls Royce, so to speak. This is very ergonomic because it allows you to have a trainer, it allows you to have um, a trainee, a cameraman, and allows four ports, and we can insert the camera through 16 different portions, plus we can do Trendelenburg, etc. So this is a very, very, very good machine. And our first set of 21st year residents trained on this versus box training. And we found that definitely using the virtual reality, in particular, this particular machine, because it's task-based and it's much more advanced than the other one and is much more lifelike and ergonomic, definitely virtual reality was better than the box trainers in this particular situation. As you can see, we also trained them on introduction using pelvises, uh, which we filled with foam and balloons so that in case they actually hit the award the balloon would rupture. After that, these 20 uh, candidates went down to the OR and basically did actual laparoscopies on patients in order to check and see the, the, the face constructability and face validity, which you can see in the end was quite high with the Lapro-S relative to the box training. 
Uh, another prospective analysis that is ongoing, we're comparing low fidelity uh, and versus high fidelity in improving laparoscopic ovarian cystectomies. So the low fidelity, we're using the pelvi uh, trainers together with the Ethicon uh, balloons that uh, Dr. Rebecca Malik just showed. And on the other hand, we're using our Lapro S to do these cases and then they go down and after they finish their training, actually work on real life cases. So this is one of the candidates doing a laparoscopy after having done approximately 20 cases on the Lapro S. Uh, here you can see, this is what the Lapro S looks like. You can use either bipolar, you can use monopolar, you can actually get the cyst out either by fishing it out or you can basically use a hydro sector to move it around, flush it out. This is one of the cases that they did live. As you can see, this is a tiny, uh, basically small um, dermoid cyst. And this was done by one of the candidates who trained on the Lapro S trainer. As you can see, it's very lifelike up on the left is the Lapro S, down below is real life. And extremely, extremely similar. And the haptic feedback, you feel as if you're doing the real thing. Uh, we also have immersive 360 degree. This is for the novices, so they can actually go into the OR. And basically we've got the surroundings as if they've got, we can actually put people in the OR around them, nurses, doctors. Etc. We have multiple modules. Some of the modules, like this module, for example, for hysterectomy, here we're opening the cuff. As you can see, it's very lifelike. The graphics are really good. And we have, this is on the lap sim. It's even better on the uh, vertimeds. Um, virtual reality hysteroscopy. We also have one of those. And this is a very, very efficient machine. We have over 75 different cases we can do polypectomies, myomectomies of various grades. We can do uh, endometrial ablations, endometrial resections, septum resections, anything you can believe we did. And during COVID in June 2020, we did our first world first actually, hybrid Zoom training. We had 40 candidates from Cairo and Switzerland at the same time. And basically uh, we had Dr. Walid Saber, who's a professor and an excellent stroscopist with us. And basically we had the candidates working both in Zurich and in Cairo on two simulators at the same time, and we were teaching. This is re really very, very good at the time. And then our, our first thesis, which is a PhD thesis, 122 candidates on basic and advanced hysteroscopy using this machine. All of this is going to be published very soon. This is the machine, this is the work. And here, this is Ihab Siliman, our previous chairman, uh, learning hysteroscopy <laughs> and basically we had an ongoing uh, currently uh, transference of skills so after working on the simulator they're actually working in the OR to see how they're doing and this is an ongoing involving 60 residents and assistant lectures and then we had handheld articulated laparoscopy I trained on the da Vinci way back in 2013 and so nowadays, the Da Vinci is very expensive, but now we have handheld laparoscopic instruments. So I was able to get the first to come to Egypt. We smuggled them in actually. And basically my resident, Yasmin, uh, basically we got 21st year residents and 20 laparoscopists. And we had them work on these articulated robotic-like instruments. And we saw the learning curve. We found the learning curve for people who had no laparoscopic experience was much quicker, much faster than the people who did laparoscopy because they had to unlearn because this is very intuitive. What you see is what you get. And so this is very, very good in cases where you're going to be doing pelvic lymphadenectomy, much, much cheaper than a robot. And then the next step was my other resident, Tamer. This is Yasmin. My other resident, Tamer, wanted to do something similar. And so I was able to get him these robotic, basically electronic instruments. And uh, this, we're doing it and we're closing uh, the vaginal vault during laparoscopic hysterectomies using this machinery right now. And then we had training on IED insertion. This was part of the presidential initiative uh, together with Bayer and uh, the uh, uh, Ministry of Health. We trained 1,001 doctors in the first year, 
502 doctors, which ended August 18th of this year, for a total of 1,503 doctors who trained on our basically unique hybrid model. We used virtual reality, we used models, and we used lectures, and we have 1,503 people who trained with us over the past year and a half. These are part of them. We also have multidisciplinary residents from urology because we have, the simulator has basically urology, we also have surgery, they can do cholecystectomy. And then we wanted to something else. So basically I wanted to add augmented reality. So what I did was I smuggled in two polo lenses. They're the only two, the first to come to Egypt. And using these, we can actually do hololens surgery. So instead of basically looking at uh, CTs, MRIs, why can I not just basically put them in front of me and work while I'm doing that? And so this is actually what we did. Um, let's go back for a second. Okay, well, you missed that. <coughs> Next, we're trying to use them for augmented reality. We're taking the specimens in the museum, we're digitizing them, and so they can go in and they can literally hold the specimen, turn it inside out and look inside it. And so these 1,300 specimens are not just external, they're also internal. We also use the, this for uh, anatomy. It's absolutely amazing. I wish we had this when we were students. So what about trainers? We have excellent trainers. These trainers basically have enthusiasm, mastery of subject, and empathy. And these are some of our trainers, excellent people, all of them basically part of our staff. All of these people receive absolutely no enumeration. Any simulator-based educational program is based on the curriculum, not the simulator. Overall, we've trained over 2,000 physicians over three years. We have regularly scheduled laparoscopy and hysteroscopy courses, and we're still actively working with the Ministry of Health. What do we have? We're getting obstetric simulators for ultrasound. We're getting the birthing simulator, basically our Lucina, including virtual reality to combat the high cesarean section rate. This is coming next month. And basically we're to cooperating with Tokyo University so that we can basically do uh, augmented reality during surgery to look at blood vessels. We're also working with the French to do augmented reality to visualize myomas during laparoscopic surgery and the ureter in case where you have basically frozen pelvises. So we're doing quite a lot. And the conclusion, it's not a substitute, it's an addition to regular training. Uh, published evidence, it reduces time uh, for the novices to develop skills, must be part of a surgical residence. Nothing matters if it doesn't impact the way we treat patients, and nothing matters if you do not teach the young generation. Thank you very much. <laughs>